What's up YouTube, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to talk about something a little different, guys. We're going back to some six liter content. I know you guys are gonna enjoy this. And today's big conversation is going to be, what are the first few things you should do once you buy a 6.0 power stroke? Guys, drop those comments down below. I wanna know what were the first few things you did when you first got your 6.0 power stroke? So you're getting a 6.0, Ford's second most hated diesel. Sorry 6.4 guys, you guys win that battle for literally the most hated Ford diesel ever my sympathies. The 6.0, however, not without its faults, had it was a very finicky kind of engine, especially when a lot of people didn't understand how everything led to one another. For instance, that your fuel pressure shouldn't dip below 45 PSI or you're gonna damage your injector, so people are taking injectors out. Or that the oil cooler, once it clogged, was gonna fry your EGR cooler, pushing coolant into your engine. Anyway, so we get a lot of questions here on the channel or I'm on a lot of forums as well, trying to stay active in the community. And we see a lot of questions about what are the first things I should do where I'm getting a 6.0, I should stud it. And, and all these questions I just wanna talk about and clear up some things and hopefully save some people some money in the long haul that really, those aren't the things you need to do. Now, when you first get your 6.0 guys, I highly recommend getting some type of monitor. It's gonna allow you to really diagnose issues that are there or could show up, catch them early before they become an issue and cause you something expensive down the road. Now, once you get that monitor, you're gonna to wanna to set up a few different things. You want exhaust temps, that's more of a just safety thing, especially if you're running tuned or towing heavy, you wanna keep an eye on them. But you definitely wanna hook up fuel pressure. So you definitely wanna get fuel pressure being monitored. It's very important because again, like I stated earlier, you can damage your injectors if you're under 45 PSI. So when you're under 45 PSI, it won't allow the injector to fill up. So when you're under 45 PSI, the body of the injector doesn't fill up with fuel and that kind of acts as a shock absorber for some of the moving parts inside the injector. So it's basically like having worn out shocks. It's gonna damage other components to the injector. This very commonly will lead to damage down the road and cost you to have to get new injectors when things aren't working correctly anymore. So that is the first thing you wanna do. And a lot of the other things kind of stem off of that. So you're gonna get a monitor. It's super important and I've uh, done videos about the best diesel monitor. I think CT Edge CTS products are the best monitors, not the best programmers for six liters, but by far the best, most comprehensive monitoring system you can get. Now, if you're on a budget, you can still do some other stuff, like I've gone over Torque Pro or Forescan. Neither of those, to my knowledge, at this time allow you to monitor fuel pressure. So you can go with like a cheaper gauge. I've had good luck with Glow Shift. I know a lot of people call them something else, but they've been super good for me in my experience with them. I'd probably run one of them to kind of keep an eye on your fuel pressure. This will at least let you monitor it relatively inexpensively and give you the ability to make sure you're not causing damage. Now, also another thing related to fuel pressure, get a blue spring mod. There's a ton of videos out there. I've done one on it. And basically it's in the fuel bowl. You change a spring out, it'll increase your pressure. The, a lot of trucks will have this done by now, but there's still a bunch of trucks out there that aren't running it. So if your fuel pressure is low, the first thing you want to do is change that spring out because they do weaken over time. And if your fuel pressure is still low, then from there you can start looking at if you have a filter issue or if you have a issue with the pump itself and get those things replaced uh, and make sure you're not starving your injectors. Moving on from there, guys, you wanna check your oil and your coolant temps. Basically, you wanna get the truck up to operating temperature. You wanna go down the highway at 65 miles an hour. You wanna find the flattest stretch of road you can and hit the cruise control and find out you don't want that delta difference to be anything more than 15 degrees. And if you're at 15, you should probably be considering some type of way of, of resolving that, either trying a back flush or just flat out replacing the oil cooler. Uh, preferably, even on fresh oil coolers, I still can see upwards of 10 in my experience, but some people get like five to seven degrees, some people even lower. I think if you're under 10, you're clear sailing. But if you start creeping up 12, 13, I think you should be looking at back flushes or again, get it, at least being prepared to change your oil cooler. Why is that so important? The reason that's so important is if your oil cooler clogs, it starves your EGR cooler if you're still running one. So if you're still running your EGR cooler, what can happen is the oil cooler won't send coolant to it to cool down the exhaust gases. What happens is they can rupture and they'll push coolant into your engine which can cause you to replace head gaskets. Now, early on, Ford didn't realize, or many mechanics out there didn't realize that if your EGR cooler ruptured, you most likely had an oil cooler that had failed at the same time. So now, it, they used to just replace one, you'd have to go back a couple months later for the other one, because again, they both failed, they just failed at different times 
or they were failed and one led to the other. They didn't realize the initial one. So now it's mandatory. If you have an EGR cooler uh, failure, you're going to replace an oil and EGR cooler at Ford, which is the right way to do it. So that's a good thing. The next thing we need to do is need to address the EGR cooler. I'm not saying you need to delete it. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I really like my ODOG S3R intake manifold. I think it's one of the cleanest setups to delete. It's also very expensive. Not everybody can afford to do that. And there's lots of other delete kits out there, you know, for the only the guys that are using their vehicles off road. We would never delete emissions on this channel and drive it on the street ever. Anyway though, so you need to address that. Now there's lots of great upgraded oil oil coolers. EGR coolers out there guys to try Bulletproof Diesel made a huge name for themselves strictly on this product. They have one of the nicest setups out there and a lot of people have used a very similar setup after Bulletproof Diesel did theirs. So there's numerous reliable EGR coolers out there that you can go for. Do some research. Again, Bulletproof Diesel is the one I'm most familiar with. I know AFE has, there's a bunch of them out there guys. So find out a good one and use it. That would be my recommendation. There's plenty of reviews out there online. Moving on again, we need to go back to that monitor. We need to check FICOM voltage. Uh, you're gonna be looking for FICOM voltage main. So FICM, if you're not familiar with FICOM, put it here somewhere. Anyway, the voltage for that should be 48 volts. If you see 47.5 or 47, you're okay. Sometimes you'll see 49 uh, out of a stock one. You know, there's a little bit of a variance in that. But if you're seeing under 47 volts at any time, whether that's cranking with good batteries, if you have to have good batteries, guys. So if you're cranking it over and you have good batteries and you see that start dipping below, you're gonna you you're on the way out and you should be looking at a replacement of some sort. The guys over at FickhamRepair.com is who I would send mine out to, and I would also consider either the Economy Tune that they have for it or the Atlas 40, depending on your overall setup. I don't recommend the 80 or the 100 or the Hercules tune, which is a 100 horsepower tune. And that's not, so there's FICOM tuning and there's ECM tuning, which is a video for a whole nother time because that can be a little bit of a complicated topic. But basically they'll help with having those tunes. That, again, I recommend the Economy or the Atlas 40, which at some point we will run on our six liter. And it just kind of helps refine the injectors a little bit. You can help clear up if you have big nozzle, bigger nozzles, I should say, you can get tuning from your FICOM to help really clean that up, kind of bring back some idle quality if you're really running a big nozzle, and kind of help fine tune the whole setup. ECM tuning does a lot. There's a little left on the table with the FICOM tuning, and I do recommend it if, if you're in that predicament. I, like I said, I do plan to do it when I go to my next set of injectors in my 6L. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is head gaskets. I get a ton of questions on, I'm buying a 6.0, should I turn around and do head studs right away? or hey, am I gonna blow head gaskets and it's gonna leave me stranded? So I wanna address a few different things here. First off, if your truck does not have head gasket issues, don't waste your money. The only time I recommend doing head gaskets when you don't have issues is if you know coming out of the gates you're looking at a 500, 550 horsepower build, or you plan to run a race tune all the time at 450-ish horsepower then yes, go ahead, replace your, get head studs. I highly recommend Kill Devil Diesel O-ringed heads. I am not a paid sponsor for that. I just really like their product and I do think Jared at Kill Devil does a fantastic job. So I do recommend that if you're going to stud it, if you're planning that kind of build, get Kill Devil Diesel heads. And even then, if you're in the 450 range, I'd rock and roll until it fricking blows. Um, you're not gonna cause a whole bunch more damage. Typically when you blow head gaskets, you're gonna lift the head. Uh, it's gonna be a bad afternoon for you. You're gonna have a big mess to clean up. But honestly, there's a lot of guys out there running 400 horsepower tunes and they've got a ton of miles on them. I did it for a long time. I ran tunes and didn't have issues. Some people run them for 200 miles and have issues. So don't think anytime you're increasing power, you are increasing the chance of blowing a head gasket. Keep that in mind. But I ran a tow tune for about, I ran a, Prime, I should say I ran primarily a tow tune for about 100,000 miles in the occasional performance tune in there for here and there. And I didn't have, I didn't lift a head, I cracked a cylinder head, which is a relatively common issue with the factory heads on these trucks. So again, unless you're planning something crazy, guys, I don't recommend it. The other question I get is a lot of, if I blow head gas because it's going to leave me stranded. Typically, no. I'm not going to say it won't. But typically, uh, you'll be pulling a hill, 
it'll lift the head you know if you're towing a camper it'll lift the head and you're gonna have issues but you're gonna be able to make it home. So I would not turn around and replace your factory head bolts if you're not having issues. Again, unless you're talking about you know you're gonna you know you're gonna be super hard on it, you know you're gonna abuse it, and you have every intention of blowing head gaskets, that's a little bit different. But if you're gonna treat the truck right and not abuse it, and you don't have issues, save your money, make sure you're saving up for it, because it, it probably will happen, guys. Now I will say you will minimize your chance if you keep an eye on your EGR cooler, you're watching your oil cooler, making sure they're healthy and you're making sure that your truck is well taken care of, it's going to be fine and you'll be more likely to get life out of it. That being said, there's guys that watch everything perfectly, they still blow, it does happen. Be aware of it, but I do think it's not the same issue that everybody's made it out to be. Again, a lot of head gasket failures are chalked up to bad EGR coolers, bad oil coolers, people not realizing it having repeat failures because people weren't given the education they need to correctly fix certain issues because we didn't know about it. Now we know about it, we don't have those issues anymore, or at least not nearly at the rate that they were previously. Now coming down to our last two things that I recommend doing, the first one is if you have any of the plastic side cold intercooler pipes, get rid of them. They break the worst time, they sound like a gun going off, it's going to scare you a little bit, pucker up. But just turn around and replace them. I really like my No Limit Fab setup. MBRP has really nice stuff. There's other quality pieces out there, but I really just recommend No Limit Fabrication or MBRP for that side, or for the cold side. I run an MBRP for my hot side and No Limit on my cold side. So I've tried both of them and I can say this, they both have really nice overall quality, really nice clamps and really nice boots and I'm hard on my truck and they've never let they've never given me an issue. Oh, and SoCal Billet makes a really nice one. I haven't looked up the price of that, but uh, none of the products I just listed are super cheap, by the way. What I have tried out, and I'll put this link maybe down below if I can find it. I have tried the cheap intercooler pipes and let me just tell you, there's issues with them. Don't try to cheap out because you're gonna end up spending more money in the end trying to cheap out than if you bought the nice stuff round one. Now there are times you can get away buying cheaper stuff and it's fine. This is not one of them. I have not seen cheap pipes that hold up the way that the more expensive ones do. The fit and finish on the more expensive ones is just superior, but I've tested them guys for you and found out that's a rough path to take. And the last thing I would do for you guys that just purchased your 6.0 Power Stroke, this really goes for just about any diesel pickup or almost any vehicle out there, get fresh fluids and filters in there. Unless you know that these things have been serviced recently and you can verify that and it was a quality shop, uh, go in, change your axle fluids, change your transmission fluid, change your diff, um, not diff fluid, um, trans, uh, transfer case fluid, there we go. Took me a while there. Uh, get fresh oil in there, use OEM filters, guys. Do not cheap out on filters. Go to Ford, get the correct thing. Now for you, 5R guys, which is most of the 6 liter world, and you can get the high flow 6.4 transmission filter, that's what I would recommend, get a 6.4 pan, whether that be a deep dish pan, or if that is a just a standard one. Now, I do recommend, see my transmission build videos on this, but I do recommend getting one of the deep dish cast pans and putting the 6.4 filter in there. Just they're thicker, they help give some case strength, and the 5R is a long transmission. What can happen with that, which is partially responsible for the three to five shift flare you guys may have heard about. So the case itself is pretty long. And so here's the front, here's the tail section. And basically they can torque like this. Again, not obviously not that much, but what, that hap what can happen is it doesn't let certain ports inside it line up correctly. And that'll give you a three to five shift flare over time. So with that deep dish transmission case that has like the big cast aluminum, so it has like a quarter inch thick, uh, flange that mounts to the transmission. It helps provide rigidity to the case and will help with that flex in the case and hopefully give you a nice long transmission life. Also, the fluid you're going to top off in it, I don't recommend flushing the transmission, but just topping it off. So drain and fill essentially, and you should be good to go. Anyway, guys, this is the top things I would do if I just bought a 6.0 power stroke today. Again, some of those things go over to with this truck. I don't think you can see I have my monitor mounted up in there. I keep an eye on stuff. And maybe down the road, I'll do a 6.7 video on what to do when you first get a 6.7. 
or I do have a purchasing a 6.7 video coming out in the near future as well. I wanna do some informative 6.0 power stroke stuff for you guys, including diagnosing a no start. Anyway, YouTube, that is all for now. Smash that subscribe button if you haven't already. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our future uploads, guys. Anyway, YouTube, that's all for now. I'll catch you in the next upload.